Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2019. Can I ask that all mobile devices are switched off and put away, please? Um, we have apologies from Annie Wells this morning. Can I welcome Alison Harris? And also apologies from Mary Fee. Um, welcome Rhoda Grant. And uh, John Finney, the member in charge of the bill, has joined us this morning as well. You're welcome. Agenda item one is um, a decision on taking items three and four in private. These are consideration of the committee's approach to forthcoming legislation and its approach to scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2020 to 21. Are committee members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Um, can I welcome Lord Advocate James Wolfe QC and Anne-Marie Hicks, National Procurator Fiscal for Domestic Abuse at the Crown Office and Procuration Fiscal Service. Um, you're both very welcome. Good morning. Um, Lord Advocate, can I invite you to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, please? Yes, thank you very much, Convener. And, um, I, I'm very grateful to, for the invitation to come and give evidence um, uh, again to this committee as head of the system for the investigation and prosecution of uh, crime in Scotland and to supplement the written evidence that you've already received from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Um, the bill which you have under consideration will simplify the law by removing from the law of assault the defence of reasonable chastisement and re by repealing section 51 of the 2003 Act which restricts the scope of that defence. And it's worth being clear at the outset that as the law currently stands, parents do not have an unqualified right to smack or chastise a child. Subject to the defence of reasonable chastisement, an assault by a parent on a child is a criminal offence. Allegations that a parent has assaulted their child are investigated by the police and reported to the Crown and may be and are prosecuted. When considering any report of an alleged crime, the prosecutor must address two things. First, whether there is sufficient admissible, credible and reliable evidence that the accused has committed a crime known to the law of Scotland. And secondly, if there is sufficient evidence, what action, if any, would be in the public interest? Those considerations apply to an allegation that a parent has assaulted their child, just as they apply in any other case. The Scottish Prosecution Code sets out the factors which may, depending on the circumstances, be relevant in assessing the public interest. Those include the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim and other witnesses, the age, background and personal circumstances of the accused, the age and personal circumstances of the victim and other witnesses, the attitude of the victim, the motive for the crime, uh, the age of the offence, mitigating circumstances, the effect of the prosecution on the accused and the risk of further offending. And the Code points out that the actions available to prosecutors are not limited to prosecution. They include diversion, a formal warning and various direct measures which a prosecutor may offer as an alternative to prosecution. And in appropriate circumstances, it may be in the public interest to take no action. Making decisions within the framework of the Scottish, Scottish Prosecution Code is part of the daily work of professional prosecutors. If this bill is passed, cases which are reported to the Procurator Fiscal will continue to be assessed by reference to the two tests which I have mentioned. Is there sufficient evidence in law that the accused has committed a crime? And if so, what action would be in the public interest? Repeal of the defence of reasonable chastisement would not mean that the prosecutor would ignore the special features of the relationship between parent and child. Those features will be present in any consideration of the public interest, for example, uh, in consideration of the context and circumstances of, of the alleged offence, the impact on the victim, the circumstances of the accused, and the effect of a prosecution on the accused and the victim. Paragraph 40 of the UNCRC General Comment 8 of 2006 reminds us that whilst all reports of violence against children should be appropriately investigated, it does not follow that all cases should, which come to light should be prosecuted. If the bill is passed, I intend to issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the investigation and reporting of allegations of assaults by parents on children. Those guidelines and prosecutorial policy will support a proportionate and appropriate response to the individual circumstances of particular cases. A response which may include, where appropriate, uh, the use of uh, informal uh, response uh, by the police, 
recorded police warnings, diversion and other alternatives to prosecution, whilst at the same time enabling prosecution where that is properly justified by reference to the circumstances of the individual case. The approach will be informed by our responsibility to protect children from harm and by our consideration of the best interests of the child. And I am confident that if this bill is enacted, Scotland's prosecutors will continue as they do today to apply sound and responsible judgment to the cases which are reported to them, consistent with the values which underpin all prosecutorial decision making, impartiality, thoroughness, integrity, sensitivity and professionalism. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we'll just move to questions from, from the committee now. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I start by putting on record my thanks to the Lord Advocate for uh, attending today? And uh, I'm pleased uh, to hear that there will be Lord Advocate's guidance uh, in the event the, the bill uh, passes. I was interested, you mentioned the legal relationship between uh, parents and, and children. Um, and I just wondered whether you would go as far as recognising that it's different and distinct from that of two adults, even where those two adults are connected? Um, one of the um, um, things that one learns as a prosecutor is that every case has to be considered um, on its individual facts and circumstances. Um, and in all the decision-making that prosecutors undertake, um, prosecutors have to look carefully at the specifics of particular facts and circumstances. And when one's dealing with um, uh, a case involving an alleged assault by a parent on a child, of course, the fact that one is dealing with a, a parent and a child is one of those circumstances. We do see, uh, we, we of course see, and you've got the statistics, we see assaults by parents on children. And where uh, a parent assaults a child and the public interest justifies it, then those cases are prosecuted. I, I guess I'm, I'm asking whether there's a different, in, in law, a recognised different relationship between parents and children than there is between, uh, between two adults. Is that is that correct? Um, the well, there the, the, there are the, the, there are legal aspects of the relationship which are um, particular to that relationship, and they're also factual. It's a factual context which is different from uh, other 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 relationships. Yes, I'm interested in what responsibilities the law places on parents um, and what uh, rights they can exercise in relation to their children. Well, I, I don't think it would um, uh, be right for me to give you a sort of general exegesis on the law of parent and child. Um, um, we're in a context where um, parents have responsibilities for uh, in relation to their children um, and have certain uh, rights with a view to promoting those uh, responsibilities. Um, uh, as prosecutors, what, what prosecutors will look at is um, what, what is the evidence in any given case? Um, does the evidence um, support the conclusion that a crime has been committed? And if a crime has been committed, what looking to the very particular circumstances of a particular case um, is the appropriate action to take in response? It would, yeah, sir wishing to come in on quite specifically yeah. on that point. Yeah. I'll bring I've got them in one there. more specific on that. On um, that, okay. Yeah, one, one more and then that, that would be me. Um, I just wonder, would they take the statutory rights and responsibilities that are set out in relation to parents into consideration when, when deciding whether or not it's in the public interest to prosecute? Well, they... Cross-reading cross across different pieces of, of the, legislation. Um, the responsibilities of children for the for, of parents for the upbringing of their children do not justify parents in committing crimes against their children thank you um, alex go hamilton and then then Rhoda grant thank you very much uh, good morning lord advocate and good morning to your colleague as well um, i just want to follow on from oliver mundell's line of question i think um, oliver was trying to bottom out exactly you know where in statute that relationship between parent and child is defined i had an intervention by Modo fraser you might have seen in the in the stage one debate around this where he said you know if if you were to apply parenting techniques to another adult for example grounding them or uh, removing something they valued as a sanction that that would be seen as abusive or or not appropriate um but then i suppose that if you have a duty of care to the person in your charge, as in a parent 
it has to their child. You could also say the same for, say, an elder relative who you look after who has Alzheimer's in a mental age or mental capacity of a three-year-old. Um, is this, uh, is there a, a legal kind of framework for the rights and responsibilities of people who have a duty of care? And is it different between people who care for their children and people who care for adults with incapacity? Um, I mean, as a generality, the legal framework um, differs. As, as prosecutors, what, what one is looking to is um, what, what does the evidence disclose? Um, and um, uh, you know, does the evidence disclose an, a crime known to the law of Scotland, in this context, an assault, an attack on the person of another uh, with deliberate intent? Um, um, if that's what the evidence discloses, what does the public interest uh, demand by way of a response? And into that latter public interest um, question, um, all the relevant facts and circumstances of any case, whether it's involving um, a parent and a child or, 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 or a vulnerable or older person, will be, will be taken into consideration. Can I ask a, a, just a, a follow very brief follow-up on that? And something that has... Uh, come up time and time again in our consideration in, in stage one of the bill, um, is that uh, that slight incongruity that um, a, an adult responsible for a child and an adult responsible for another ad adult who has a mental age of a child um, has different parameters to work within. So you would not believe for a minute that an adult could exercise the defense of reasonable punishment if they were uh, sanctioning an adult with a mental age of three. Do you think that that's incongruous? Well, it's the current state of the law, and, and what, what, what the committee is considering is whether the law should be changed. Um, 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 it, uh, prosecutors operate within the law as Parliament uh, lays it down from time to time. That's wrong. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Buddha. Can I just um, ask you, you, men you mentioned that um, parents are currently charged with assault and prosecuted for that. Can I ask if the defence of reasonable chastisement is used or are those offences so severe that nobody could use that defence at the moment? Um, and the offences cover a wide range. Um, I, 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 I did ask for some illustrations and, and have been given examples which cover the wide range from cases which were dealt with um, uh, ultimately, although it, it, uh, the prosecutor was satisfied that there was an assault in law with a decision to take no, no further action, um, cases in which um, um, options other than prosecution were taken all the way up to some of the most serious cases that, that, that we see. So we, al we already see as prosecutors a wide range. Um, and under the current law, of course, um, it may be important to separate out the stage of investigation and, and prosecution. Under the current law, um, <clears throat> in order to consider whether or not the defence is available, the, a case of, an, of uh, 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 an assault on a child would require to be investigated in order to assess whether, in all the facts and circumstances, that defence is one which uh, could properly uh, uh, be made out. I don't have any statistical information on the incidents to which the defence is uh, relied on um, by accused persons in these cases, um, or, or, or indeed in... Um, in the context of uh, prosecutorial decision making. But Anne-Marie, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add from your experience. I think while we, um, it's easier for us to, to find the cases where they involve uh, an assault on a child by a parent or someone with um, care or charge of the child, it's not necessarily easy from that to see um, the cases where someone may have then tried to assert the defence. But certainly looking at some of the cases that we have, there's quite a number of them where the incident occurred in the context of um, uh, an assault by way of punishment for something that they perceived that the child had done wrong. Um, whether you know, it was one a, a case where someone um, they thought the child had been lying or had come home late. Um, one case where um, they thought the child had stolen money from a purse. So it's clear that in the cases reported, um, we, we receive a range. Some of them are in the context of direct violence um, without a punishment element, but there are definitely cases that are reported where um, the account given is, is punishment for something that the child is, is deemed to have done wrong. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I just wondered, um, I guess, uh, if, if you think that there um, is a public interest uh, to prosecute a parent for for sort of smacking their child or, or uh, using using uh, physical uh, punishment uh, where there's no uh, child welfare concerns and where it's clear the action resulted in no lasting pain. Do you think, I guess what I'm getting at is, is are there tests that could be put into the bill or <coughs> Uh, that, that would form part of your guidance, that would that would give parents absolute clarity as to what it was you felt sort of amounted to criminal intent. Um, I think the f uh, I think I need uh, I go back to what I uh, I said a few moments ago, which is that um, in this context and in in many contexts. Um, there is no substitute for a very close attention to the facts of particular cases. Um, conduct which in one context might look relatively trivial or minor, in another context may actually carry a, a much more serious significance. So I'm not trying to be unhelpful in not being drawn on, on responding to particular um, uh, scenarios. So, 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 so what I can say is that um, it, um, the kinds of considerations that you've mentioned um, will be considerations that um, will be uh, taken into account uh, by prosecutors in considering any particular case. And um, uh, going back to my opening uh, remarks, um, that, that the um, among those considerations also will be questions of our responsibility to protect children from harm and also a recognition that um, we have to take into account the best interests of the child in, 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 in the round, among the other factors that need to be considered by, by prosecutors. And um, in relation to the um, uh, Lord Advocate's guidelines that I'll, uh, I'm minded to issue to the Chief Constable and, and which uh, I should say are currently in, we're currently in discussion with the police about, um, uh, about those. Um, I, 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 I anticipate that those will um, seek to articulate the case considerations that the police may have regard to in, 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 in considering whether or not um, it would be uh, it's necessary for them to report a particular case to the fiscal rather than taking other other action. Yeah, um, with, with, with all uh, due respect, when uh, Parliament uh, chooses to, to, to legislate for things in statute, is it, is it not normal uh, to, to at least put some parameters or tests on, on the face of a bill, as, as we've seen you know, when it came to legislating for domestic abuse? Um, and if you feel there's a need for guidance and a need to set out some of these tests for police, is it not better to put, for example, something as broad as the best interests of the child uh, onto the face of the bill? Would that not make better legislative sense and make things clearer for parents, clearer for police, um, and actually easier for you to, to operate? I think the premise of the question is that the law of assault is on. Clear. I mean, the law of assault is applied day and daily by police officers and by prosecutors, and um, there are not problems with the clarity of, of the law. At the same time, um, and indeed, I think um, uh, there's a case that can be made that the removal of the, um, the defence with the comp qualification that currently applies to it, will, will, uh, it increases the clarity, the clarity of the law. Um, uh, in terms of um, the framing of guidelines, um, I issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the police on a number of matters. Um, and um, uh, uh, for example, the framework within which police, uh, the police may issue recorded police warnings is something that I uh, defined for them by giving instructions as to when cases must be reported. So there's nothing particularly novel or unusual in the idea of, of uh, giving uh, a framework within which uh, the police may act. Um, I should say it's a feature of our system of law that prosecutors, are, the police are not obliged to report every 
crime, they report within parameters I lay down, and prosecutors are not obliged to prosecute every crime. Uh, prosecutors' um, responsibility is to take the action that's appropriate in the public interest in any given case. Mandel, I've got a couple of yeah. following subs, if that's OK to pause you at that point. I'll come back. I'll come back to you, yeah. Um, Fulton. Thanks, Convener, and, and good morning, panel. Thanks very much for uh, attending today. Um, and I, I really welcomed the report that you provided to the committee, and I thought it was very helpful uh, for our stage one deliberations. Based on what you've said in your opening statements and some of your answers to uh, Oliver and Dale, what, I, what I'd like to try and tease out is what, what would be the difference if, a, um, if, uh, if, a, if there's an allegation that a child has been smacked or physical force uh, used on a child? What would be the difference? Um, the day before the bill comes into law and the day after for, for your team? Um, well, I, I suppose the starting point is that, um, um, uh, and let's start with the question of investigation. Um, the matter must have come, must, you know, for something to happen, it has to be brought to the attention of the authorities, brought to the attention of the police. Um, today, if, 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 if an allegation were made that a, a parent had assaulted uh, a child, the police would um, require to investigate that. Um, they would be investigating it within the framework of the, the current legal regime. Um, they would, um, uh, um, in appropriate circumstances, report the matter to the fiscal. The fiscal would assess the the, uh, the evidence available asking is there, a cri is there evidence that a crime has been committed, is there sufficient evidence in law, if there is, what's the public interest. Um, after the bill is passed, um, uh, that th those processes will be the same. The one thing that will be different is that the um, qualified defence that is currently available to the allegation of assault um, will not be part of the law and therefore wouldn't form part of the analysis of the legal question uh, that police officers and, um, and ultimately prosecutors would have to ask themselves. But again, Anne-Marie, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to, 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 to say from, a, from, from your experience. Um, I mean, I think um, obviously cases will still, as the Lord Advocate said, they are reported today, they will still be reported. I think the, the key difference in this is at the moment we have this available defence. It is only an available defence. It doesn't, it's not a barrier to cases being prosecuted. And Section 51 of the 2003 Act sets out factors for the court to consider. So the court could consider all these factors and, and people would still be convicted of, of smacking and, and are where the circumstances merit it and the defence isn't met out. So um, in a sense, it just provides clarity that it's no longer a defence to use physical violence as a form of punishment on your children. And that, I suppose, is a, a clearer statement than, than what is at the moment, which is it might be and it might not be, and it depends on whether the test of the defence is made out. And then, uh, sort of, kind of a, a very brief... Specifically, is that...? Yeah, it's just, just, okay. a, just a follow-up. You know. um, I, don't, I don't know if you, you've seen the evidence that we got from Social Work Scotland and uh, Police Scotland in, the, in the, the, the Stage 1 evidence gathering, and uh, both of them said that they didn't think there would be any change to the way that they dealt with the process on the day before the law, uh, the day after the law, uh, sorry, was um, as, as to be passed. Um, do you, do you recognise that, um, that um, from the police? I think the police have an obligation in terms of child protection work that they do to investigate any concerns that are brought to their attention about a child. So that happens today, that will happen tomorrow. If this bill's passed, that will happen then. If there's evidence of a crime, they would report it. Um, now, obviously, as prosecutors, if there is an available defence of reasonable chastisement, justifiable assault, we would have to consider that in, in our considerations. If that's no longer a defence, then that won't be a factor in it. But the same public interest considerations would still apply um, and a lot of the considerations that I think are looked at in terms of um, the, the defence at the moment, looking at the nature and gravity of the offence um, and all the surrounding context and circumstances are exactly what we do and what we will continue to do. 
Thank you, Mina. Um, Lord Advocate, I'd like to explore the, um, the issue of Lord Advocate's guidelines. I've come across these once before in uh, my previous professional capacity. When your predecessor issued guidelines around uh, the criminalisation of people who are victims of human trafficking who are coerced into committing criminal acts, on that occasion we actually came up against that because those had not been adhered to by the police and uh, um, young people who were victims of trafficking had ended up in Parliament um, despite the, the guidelines of your predecessor. I guess my question is about how, first of all, um, in the case of this bill, when do you anticipate issuing those guidelines? Secondly, how are they then disseminated to your coppers on the ground, as it were? Um, well, um, as, I, as I said uh, uh, earlier, um, we're already in discussion with Police Scotland about um, the um, shape and parameters for uh, guidelines so we, we, we you know that's under active consideration I certainly um, um, would uh, intend to issue guidelines um, uh, um, as uh, as near as possible with the coming into force of the uh, 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 legislation um, their, gui their, their, their guidelines I issued the Chief Constable and it's his responsibility then to disseminate the um, instructions to his officers on, on the ground. And I don't know if there's anything you want um, to add. No, I mean, I think it is. It's, a, it's an area we will now have to work with the police in terms of um, I, um, agreeing the, the content of any guidelines and then it would be a matter for the police to, to um, incorporate them. Um, and a very tiny, tiny follow-up is, um, is there any cause for you then to um, adapt those guidelines over the passage of time if, if you ascertain that actually it's not working properly or there's been too many prosecutions or too few? Do you, do you um, move those guidelines or change them in any way? Uh, I, mean, I have the power to issue, uh, under statute, to issue instructions to the Chief Constable in relation to the reporting of crime. Mm -hmm. Um, these matters are kept under review. I should say I don't recognise the idea of there being too many or too few prosecutions. That's not the way that we, we think about uh, the job that we, 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 we require to do. I think a, a good example of this is the Lord Advocate's issued guidelines on liberation, which have been amended in light of the Criminal Justice Act 2016, which introduced new provisions on liberation on undertaking and on investigative liberation. So they were updated um, to take account of that. So that was a normal practice that we would adopt. Thank you. Okay. Alison. I've been listening with interest this morning, but I, I just would like to ask you a couple of questions, please. During the stage one debate, Marie Todd said, and I quote, I assure members that our intention is not to criminalise parents. So could I ask you, does that intention have any legal force? And also, would it be, in your view, fair to say that it's a foreseeable outcome and consequence of this particular bill? Um, the, I mean, for, uh, 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 from a prosecutorial point of view, you know, the law is whatever Parliament um, enacts. Um, um, uh, you know, we, we, we look to, to the, the law as it is in common law and in, in statute. Um, um, I think it's perhaps important to keep in mind that um, at present it is a crime to, for a parent to assault uh, a child. Um, so, um, as I said in my introduction, um, um, the, um, the, the law currently treats as criminal parents who assault their children. There is a qualified defence of reasonable chastisement which is currently available and which will no longer be available to uh, parents who uh, who, 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 who assault their children if, if this bill is passed. Okay, so could I just kind of try and drill down on that? You know, I appreciate there's the reasonable chastisement element to things, but does this not mean that this bill has the potential then to come to basically criminalise loving and caring parents who use a smack on the back of the hand, on the, the back of the bottom, a light tap, you know, this has the potential then ultimately to potentially criminalise them because that is now going to be deemed assault and you're removing this reasonable chastisement clause. Um, it, it, it's not a defence to an allegation of assault that it was um, motivated by, 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 by love. Um, uh, that um, 
the, the whole facts and circumstances are facts and circumstances that would be taken into account um, in the context of um, considering what action is appropriate in the public interest. Um, if, if there's sufficient evidence that a, a crime uh, ha, ha, has been uh, committed. If I can give you a, 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 a well, the, 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 there are a range of circumstances in which um, uh, crimes are committed and people offer uh, benign motives as, as um, part of the uh, 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 and the motivation is not is not of of itself of itself a defence, though it may be highly relevant, may be highly relevant to the decision making in relation to how the law responds. I, mean, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I mean, I, go down I, to ask some questions about guidelines. Are you and guidance? Are you? Well, that was part of it. Okay. So I appreciate you did mention guidelines. Are you bringing in guidelines? But mm. okay. Sorry, um, I'm just going to say. I mean, I understand that the intention of the bill is to is is to remove the defence so that parents can no longer claim it's acceptable to use physical violence as a form of corporal punishment of children. You know, it's it's no longer acceptable. Um, and obviously, that's the the policy driver of the bill, and to change attitudes. And I think um, I've read the policy memorandum and. Um, my team have been involved, you know, in, in the kind of ongoing discussions and watched with interest as well about the development. So I understand that it's that it's not been introduced with a with a view to seeking to, you know, it's not about increasing numbers of people in court, um, etc. It's about actually saying that you shouldn't use um, physical punishment, physical violence as a form of punishment in your children, and so it's removing the defence. Um, so I, I think that's the kind of simplicity of it, but I think what the Lord Advocate is saying is that, you know, already physical violence used as a form of punishment can be a form of assault. It is today. Um, it would be after this uh, passes. It's just that we would no longer have any statutory defence that could be claimed. Um, so the law... Is, is being simplified, but it's not a whole new framework where, you know, at the moment people can smack their children and say that, you know, that that's absolutely fine in every circumstance because it isn't in terms of the current law. OK, thank you. OK, and a brief supplementary from Oliver Medell. Uh, I feel you've sort of danced round the sort of issue a little bit there because is it, is it not correct that where a defence is successfully established that's in effect saying that a crime has not been committed. Yes. So by removing the defence, you're creating a new area of behaviour that's criminal. We heard that from the Law Society, uh, from uh, Professor of Law at Dundee University, from several criminal law agents. This will create a new category of behaviour that is criminal. Oh, well, I, I think one ha yeah, I mean, one has to be um, um, uh, clear about that. By removing a defence in law, there, 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 there will be, um, by definition, there will be conduct where currently the defence could be successfully invoked, where it can no longer be successfully uh, uh, invoked. Um. And do you, do you think, as a matter of policy, it's a good idea to have legislation on the statute books uh, that you don't intend to enforce in, in, in all circumstances, most circumstances, or some particular circumstances? Um, I, I, it, um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a feature of our legal system across the board that um, where there's sufficient evidence that a crime has been committed, prosecutors assess what is the appropriate response in the public interest. We see that with uh, in... Um, all areas of criminality. We, we in our system do not prosecute and we're not obliged to prosecute every case uh, that's reported to us. Um, there are a range of possible responses which include diversion from prosecution, include a range of direct measures um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and ultimately taking no action. And the same principles are applied by prosecutors every day to um, uh, to, to, to cases across the wide spectrum of, 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 of cases that are reported to them. Briefly. Just, just on, on the back of Oliver Mundell's thing. question, if I may convene it, um, one of the concerns that critis, critics of this bill um, voice is that this will see the criminalization of many 
parents or, or you know hundreds of parents in normal parenting behavior which presupposes that this legal defense is being used hundreds of times um is that accurate um i th i, I I have no statistical way of answering that question. Um, um, I, I, I don't, Anne-Marie, unless, unless you tell me and otherwise, I don't, I don't have any data which would allow me to give a, uh, you know, to give a figure. It, it, it is unknown in the, in the true sense what, whether this will result in an increase in cases being reported or, 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 or not. Um, um, we do see that if, um, if there is new legislation and attendant publicity around that, that may result in an increase in reporting, partly because attitudes change and, and, and people are sensitized to behavior that they might not otherwise have, 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 have reported. At the same time, no doubt it may have an impact in changing behaviors in, in another direction. Um, uh, so, um, the question of whether there'll be more cases reported um, is, is, I think, something that we, we you know, remains to be seen. Um, I haven't looked at the kind of international kind of experience of where this has happened elsewhere. It would suggest that you, you won't see, you know, really significant increases in, in prosecution, but I think it, it remains to be seen in terms of um, numbers of cases reported. I think um, in my experience dealing with domestic abuse, if I can give a parallel um, when the law changes and there's greater public awareness that um, behaviour is not acceptable, um, people, um, other members of the public might uh, involve the authorities more. And we've certainly seen that in a domestic abuse context where um, neighbours, other people will pick up the phone to the police to report things rather than perhaps the attitudes of 20, 30 years ago where things were overlooked as just domestic and, and were maybe not reported. I think we've seen that in some of the cases that we have where it's members of the public, where something has happened in public who have um, intervened and who have, have called the police. So I think you, you might have that if there's greater public awareness around it. Um, but I, I think the policy intent of the bill was made really clear. It's not all about prosecution. It's not all about the criminal law. It's actually about um, saying that this is not an acceptable way to, um, to chastise your, your children. So there are a couple of members that are making signals at me that they've got brief supplementaries that they'll ask before Rhoda Drank comes in. Are you, are you being... Right, OK. Fulton, we'll take your step and then we'll go to... Yeah, uh, th thanks again, convener. Um, I suppose we've had a lot of talk during the, the bill about um, the possible criminalisation uh, of parents or an increase in the criminalisation of parents, and it's not something that the evidence has pointed to uh, at all. I know it's difficult for you to, to to give a view on that, but the evidence certainly hasn't pointed to that. But but would you would you agree that the 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 biggest challenge we face just now, I'm wondering from a, a prosecution point of view, is actually um, uh, you know prosecuting really terrible offences against children, rather than worrying about whether this bill will lead to an increase in prosecution for parents? Um, prosecutors deal with a wide range of, 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 of offending, from the most, uh, the most serious um, uh, offending and um, to offending at the other end of the scale. And that's why, uh, as I indicated in my opening statement, um, we are focused on taking action which is appropriate and proportionate to the particular circumstances of the particular case that, uh, that, that, that comes before uh, the prosecutor. Um, uh, I think it'd be, you know, we can all, um, all assess the relative gravity and seriousness of, of different um, uh, types of criminality that we uh, have to deal with and, and prosecutors respond in a way that um, reflects that. Um, what are you um, a number of times you mentioned when the decision is taken whether or not to prosecute, you look at what would be in the public interest. And I wonder if I can push you a wee bit on that as to where that falls. You know, what would, what would you consider to be in the public interest? What would you consider not to be in the public interest? Is there examples of where, that you could give us that would kind of illustrate that for us? 
Yes, I mean, the, the Scottish Prosecution Code sets out, um, and it's a publicly available document, um, sets out um, factors that, depending on the circumstances, may uh, will inform the consideration of the public interest. And unsurprisingly, it includes the, the nature and gravity of the offence, um, um, the impact of the offence on the victim. So I think um, um, Mr. Mandel's question about harm is, is a consideration that would come into play um, uh, in relation to impact on the victim. Um, age background and personal circumstances of the accused and, and, and of the victim. Um, the motive for the crime is a factor that would be taken into account in the public interest, to pick up the question that uh, Ms. Harris um, uh, raised with me. So, um, and the code sets out a little more detail under each of the public interest factors that are identified uh, uh, there. Now, those are factors that will apply in any in relation to any report of any crime, and they're factors that prosecutors are well used to applying and which they apply currently when uh, cases involving alleged assaults by parents on children are brought to their attention. So Anne-Marie mentioned... Uh, um, so in, in preparation for coming today, we looked at a few of the cases from last year where we had taken no action or taken some other kind of action than prosecution. So just to kind of illustrate, um, there was a, a case involving an assault by a mother on a 10-year-old daughter who had um, come home late um, and um, hadn't been answering uh, calls from her mother. So it was a punishment um, for, for what was deemed bad behaviour. In that case, the accused had no previous convictions. There were mental health issues. Um, we um, had information about social work involvement then with the family. Um, and um, there was getting the full information around the background, we were able to take a decision to divert for social work diversion, um, who could then work with the family around some of the issues. We had other cases where um, similar um, reported for behaviour towards uh, children where um, it was felt that because there was already a framework of support in place, we actually didn't even need to divert it because we were satisfied then that the, the police were working with social work um, and they were able to, to satisfy us that there was no actual public interest in, in, in prosecuting. Um, there was another case where um, it was involved an assault on a nine-year-old um, incident arose after a family argument in the morning, um, a time of, of great pressure and stress. The, the person um, who the parent was was working, but there was a, quite a lot of pressure in the family, I think, at the time. And again, in that, we, we received further information around um, other assistance that the family were then getting through social work, but also through other family members. And we were absolutely satisfied that no action needed to be taken. So this is the kind of information that we would look to the police to give us. It, we wouldn't just get information about the actual incident itself. We would want about the background. We would want to know, has the parent ever... Um, behaved in this way before, you know, is this in, within a context of domestic abuse? Because sadly, quite a number of the cases take place within a domestic abuse environment, not surprisingly. Um, so we would want to look at all those circumstances. Um, we would want to look at perhaps any pressures that that parent was under at that time, factors that are relevant to them as we would um, in other crimes as well. Um, so I think I, I think in terms of how we apply it at the moment and how we would apply it is that we don't look through a narrow lens of what was the individual act. It's what is the full context and circumstances of the behaviour um, and to determine what is the public interest there. And, and particularly if one's considering it at, at, at that end of the spectrum whether um, the public interest is best served by some form of diversion or... Um, uh, as Anne-Marie has said, um, um, uh, support rather than through uh, a, 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 a prosecutorial uh, option. Um, that's one of the um, one of one of the considerations. Um, at the same time, we a string of examples of cases where the balance w went the other way, and um, looking to the the circumstances, the, the particular nature of the act. The, f the full background and context, um, a decision was made to prosecute the case. Um, and we have a number of examples of, of those as well. But I think the important point, as Anne-Marie has said, is that um, um, prosecutors um, are 
routinely as part of their professional practice are considering what is the appropriate course to take it to respond to this report of an alleged crime, assuming there's sufficient evidence um, uh, to justify action. Um, and in doing that, um, in this context, as in other contexts, we'll, 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 we'll look at um, all, the relevant, all the relevant factors. Can I just ask a supplementary on that? Given child protection guidance and regulations, I would assume that normally when a case comes for prosecution, social work would already be involved. Does it um, influence your decision whether or not social work have taken action, for example, if they think there is um, the child is in danger, they may have taken action to take the child into care um, and remove it from the family home, or whether they're working for the families with the family. Are those things that you look quite closely at before you you decide how to act? We would want to know what the involvement, if any, of, of social work was, you know, if there were ongoing concerns, if there was previous behaviour that had been reported, because I think that's relevant to the context. Because one of our factors is obviously about the risk of reoffending, and that's a clear public interest consideration. So I think knowing the involvement of, of social work, but we wouldn't have a, a you know, a, a thing where if social work do this, we would do that. You know, I think it would be a, a looking at the full circumstances of the incident. And there are cases where we see where the police properly involve um, social workers that are required to do. Um, social work do a review and say, no, we're quite content that this was you know, um, an incident. There's no need for ongoing work with the family. And we, we see that in a number of cases as well. So I think we would just want to have a, a full picture so that we would understand what the situation was. OK. I'm um, over. Thank uh, you, convener. I wanted to return earlier to the sort of comments around the, the crime or common law crime of assault. And obviously, um, in our system, the parameters of that offence are, are, are in effect set by case law. Uh, do you think that there is any issue at all with the fact that this defence means uh, that there probably is a sparsity of kind of case law um, in relation to minor or mild? Uh, physical force because those cases haven't really uh, been been tested or, or, or fully explored um, and, and do you think that that's something we should give consideration to? Um, I'm not aware of there being any particular practical difficulties in the application of the law. Um, I think you're right in the sense that the case law and reasonable chastisement tends to predate the 2003 Act. Um, but I think if, if the purpose of this bill is to remove that and to say that that's no longer a, a defence, then the case law and assault will still continue to apply. So um, a sheriff will have to consider the evidence laid, decide if it does constitute a crime um, and if it's been proved beyond reasonable doubt. So I think those considerations will still apply. And obviously, if they listen to what's happened and they say that that does not constitute an assault in law, then um, there won't be a conviction. Um, and you recognise there's a possibility, though, that courts may come up with new tests of their own uh, in the absence of thresholds in the bill uh, that w w we are, in effect, they would say, you know, your, your decision to, to prosecute, in their view, wasn't what you know, wasn't in the public interest. Is that is that a possibility? I don't think they could come up with a, a new test um, in law as such. I mean, I think it's always open to a court to see to criticise a decision to prosecute, and, and we do see that occasionally. Obviously, um, it's a matter for them to determine on the evidence: has a crime been committed, and if it has, has it been proved beyond reasonable doubt? And as the decision maker in a summary case, they would then have to, to make that decision. Sentencing would be a matter for them and, and they could reflect that in sentencing um, as well if they didn't think it was an appropriate case to be prosecuted. But I don't think um, there will be an array of new tests that come up around the law of assault. As I say, we already prosecute um, cases of parental chastisement um, of us for assault that amounts to that in the courts at the moment. And I think the courts are used to dealing with that already. Yeah to evolve and develop and a number of the things that we now take pride in in this parliament for example uh, you are around marital relations between uh, between uh, married people you know they, they developed through through case law they weren't developed through statute so surely there's a possibility that common law will continue to develop in this area 
and that they might refine what they consider to, to be an assault for a parent uh, and child in the context of in the context of those parental rights and responsibilities that exist in other 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 statute. I think it would be wrong for me to preempt the, um, the the natural development of the law, but the the test, the legal test for an assault is is. Um, straightforward. It's an attack on the person uh, of another with the relevant um, 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 mens rea, um, mental um, uh, state for uh, a crime to be committed. And um, uh, courts are used to um, applying those tests in a, a range of circumstances at, at the moment. Um, they don't of course, as, as Anne-Marie says, there will be cases where a court concludes that on the evidence that the courts heard, there wasn't a crime. Um, uh, that, that happens um, uh, you know, across the board, that from, um, prosecutors assess a case, they take it to court, and on occasion um, the case is not, uh, the evidence doesn't uh, support the charge. Um, uh, equally, um, uh, as Anne-Marie has said, there are cases where, even though a crime has been committed, um, uh, 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 courts are sometimes critical of a case having been brought by a prosecutor. Um, it's our responsibility to take the cases that we consider right in the public interest, um, um, uh, 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 but sheriffs are entitled to, 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 to comment. Um, um, and at the end of the day, a sheriff will reflect um, the sheriff's assessment of the case in in any sentence that's uh, the, 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 that's imposed. Okay, um, Alex Cole. Thank you, convener. Um, I wonder, Lord Advocate, if um, Oliver Mundell's concerns about the lack of kind of case law and thresholds of that exist around this issue goes some way to answering my question, my earlier question about scale. Um, in that if really there's not a great deal to go on, as he suggests, that actually this is not a, um, a legal defence that is regularly exercised. It's not an issue that um, courts are, are asked to sit in judgment of, 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 of loving physical chastisement, as the critics of this bill would describe it um, as being reasonable. It's not something that comes up in court very often. It, it strikes me that if he's worried about the absence of case law, then this just doesn't come up very much. I think in the written evidence we, we um, provided some data on the number of cases that we had. So we looked at a period from three years ago for a, a three-month period, um, but um, increasing that to an estimation over a 12-month period, um, the estimated number of cases prosecuted was less than 500 for the whole year, and that was assaults um, on children either to injury with no injury or to severe injury. So the numbers are small um, on, on any Kind of reading um, now. Obviously, that's within a framework where we have the the, the statutory defence at the moment. But even um, taking that into account, the numbers are small. Um, and whether you know there is some increase, um, we have to wait and see. Of those who are acquitted on the basis of the defence of reasonable punishment. No, and and that's something that you would you would literally have to go through every individual <coughs> case uh, and through. So we can. We can pull cases on in terms of the, the charge and we can see that it involves a parent um, and the, the, the victim is, is, um, is a child, but we can't go into the, the, the detail of, of that without a, a very thorough kind of manual research exercise. Okay, everyone's looking content. Well, thank you very much for your um, evidence this morning. Um, the next meeting of the committee will be on Thursday the 13th of June, where we'll take evidence from Engender on their shadow report on the UN Convention on the Elimination of, Discrimi of Discrimination. Discrimination Against Women. Um, we'll now move into private session, and if I can ask the gallery to clear. <laughs>